my lands, we are live again, except on this Free Coaching Friday, we are not in my office. We are actually here at the live event at the Private Money Academy Conference here in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. And sitting right here next to me is my real estate attorney, Julie. Everybody say, hey, Julie. Hey, Julie. In fact, Ashley, just go ahead and pan around and show everybody here on the live stream these good looking people. Well, skip over these two over here, but I'm so good looking. So, yeah, folks, here on, uh, I mean, my lands, what in the world do we do here on Free Coaching Friday? Well, most Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, I go live with Free Coaching Friday, and we talk about all things real estate. We talk a lot about private money. So, if you are brand new to coming here to Free Coaching Friday, First of all, let me just do a quick introduction as to who in the world I am and why am I qualified to be talking here today. Now, our subject today is uh, how to locate a real estate investor friendly attorney. Hence, I have my real estate attorney here, Julie Wickheiser, from here in Moorhead City. But um, here's the deal. I'm known as the Private Money Authority. Uh, if you are remotely interested in real estate investing or you want to be a real estate investor, um, in fact, here's the question. If you are, in fact, I got a free gift for you. Uh, Crystal, have you, or is it, has anybody here in the audience got my, uh, on my lands, there's Jenny uh, tuning in from Raleigh. She's a Platinum and Mastermind member. Hello, Jenny. Uh, has anybody got my book, Where to Get the Money Now? Anybody got my book? Yeah, one up right here. Uh, have you got it with you? Yeah, bring it up here, bring it up here uh, for me. I want to share everybody. So everybody here on the live stream, I'm getting ready to give away a free gift to you just for being here on the live stream. And that is my new book, which is titled Where to Get the Money Now. And the subtitle is How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Without Relying on Traditional or Hard Money Lenders. This book will teach you the steps, step by step, as to how I went from having no private money. Hello there, Dan. Welcome to Free Coaching Friday. Hello there. Is that Dwayne Ashley? Hey, in the Jay. Back of the room. Uh, oh, in the back of the room. You are so cute there, Dwayne. Tuning in right here in the room. Anyway, um, I hadn't thought about getting you all to tune in. In fact, that's a great way to do it. If you've got questions for me and Julie, Jenny says it's a great book. If you've got questions for me and Julie, uh, you can type it here in the comment bar from here in the room, um, or we'll be getting to the Q&A section. Anyway, where to get the money now? If you are brand new, never done a real estate deal, or you're a wholesaler and you want to stay in some deals and you haven't had the money to fund your deals, um, and you've just gotten assignment fees, or you are a seasoned real estate investor and you just want to get more funding for your deals without paying stupid high rates to hard money lenders, I'll give you this book for free, just cover shipping and handling. So, Dan, if you would type in the comment bar uh, the URL to where I will autograph and ship this book out to you. Uh, you can get this book for free at www.jayconner.com forward slash Friday. Jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash Friday, and we'll get the book shipped right out to you. Now, I always, Julie, I always am interested in knowing where people are tuning in from. So if you're watching the live stream or you're watching the replay, these instructions work in either case. If you're on the live stream now or you're on the replay, um, all you got to do is tell me where you're from. So everybody right now, type in your city and state, type in your city and state where you're from and say hello to everybody. Dan, thank you for typing in the jconnorthere.com for us last Friday. Now, after you type in your city and state, come on folks, you're a little slow. Type in your city and state where you're from. There you go, Raleigh, North Carolina. Everybody else type in your city and state. Now, when I say something or Julie, my real estate attorney, oh my lands, there's Jonathan Broyles, hello. There's Poplarville, Mississippi. I love it, guys. I love it. So <laughs> Houston, Texas, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, Rancho Mirage, California. I'm loving that. And I'm starting to see some blue thumbs up coming across here. So everybody right now, I need, and there is uh, Alfred. Welcome to Free Coaching Friday. I need a sea of blue thumbs up coming across the screen right now, whether you're watching live or you're watching on the uh, replay, give me a bunch of blue thumbs up because when I say something you like 
or Julie is more likely going to say something that you like than me. I want you to give her blue thumbs up as we are teaching um, how we work together. There is Franklin, what's that say, Julie? I don't have my, uh, my glasses on. Frankston, Texas. From Texas. Welcome to Free Coach Friday. Now, when you really love something that we teach you and you learn here on Free Coach and Friday, I need a sea of red hearts. I need a lot of love here on Free Coach and Friday. So right now, do not give me a complex and a self-image problem. I need a lot of red hearts coming across the screen. There's Greg from, hey Greg, from Moorhead City, North Carolina. <laughs> right here in Moorhead City, I love it. And uh, wish we were there, Rick Meyer. Man, I tell y'all, so we're here at the, look at all them red hearts coming. They love you, Julie, they love you. <laughs> so right here in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, we have been here at the Private Money Academy uh, Conference, Private Money Academy Conference live, three days, nonstop. Hey, folks here in the audience, if you've learned a lot this week about getting private money, say, oh yeah! Oh, yeah! I'm loving it, loving it, loving it. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. Let's go ahead and jump in to our content today. So, so you all here on the live stream. Oh, I do need, I got one more favor to ask them, Julie. I got one more favor to ask them. So I need your help. I need your help. Uh, whether you're on the live stream or you're watching the replay. I want to get this information from my real estate attorney out to as many people as possible. So right now, tap your share button. Right now, tap your share icon. And let's get as many people right here on the live stream as we can. And when you tap your share icon right now, that's going to work not only for the live stream right now, but also for all those people that will be watching the replay. Now, who is Jay Connor and why am I qualified to talk about private money in case you've never been to Free Coaching Friday? Well, here's the short of it. My wife, Carol Joy, and I, we've been investing in real estate now since 2003. We've rehabbed over 450 houses. We're in a small market, only 40,000 people. We do two to three deals a month. Average profits are $71,000 per deal. From 2003 to 2009, I relied on local banks to fund my deals. But me, along with every other real estate investor in the world, got cut off. Hello, Leroy from Albany, New York. I got cut off from the banks. I had no way to fund my deals. So I knew, Julie, I had to find a better and quicker way to fund my deals. I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money. And since that time, I've never missed out on a deal for not having the funding. Carol Joy and I right now have 47 private lenders, individuals all across the nation that are funding our deals. So what we talk about a lot here on Free Coaching Friday is how to get funding for your deals. But we also talk about how to find deals, uh, how to sell them fast, how to automate your business, and all facets of real estate investing. So now let's get ready for this content. So if you're ready to learn about how to find a real estate investor, I mean, real estate attorney that's good to work with real, real estate investors um, and learn about how we work together, type in the comment bar right now, everybody, type in the comment bar right now, whether you're on the live stream or you're watching the replay, type in the comment bar, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. And if I don't see I'm ready, I ain't starting. So type in the comment bar right now, I am ready. Somebody's got to be, in, it must be like a slow network here. In. Okay, somebody's ready. All right, I'm ready. Here we go. So Julie, first of all, tell everybody here on the live stream, um, Alfred's ready too. Tell everybody here on the live stream uh, and here in the, uh, in the conference room, uh, introduce yourself, who you are um, and how it is that you're qualified to do what you do and what is the focus of your business? So my name is Julie Wickheiser. I am from Florida. I went to law school in Georgia and I moved to Moorhead City in 2006. Um, I got to know Jay, must have been close to about 2008 is when I moved firms and started working with an attorney who Jay had already had a relationship with. And um, we started kind of doing these deals together where I provided the, the legal side of it. I recently, in the past year and a half, opened my own law firm. Uh, I focus on real estate. 99% of my practice is real estate. Absolutely. So let me give you all an overview of how Julie and I work together. 
Uh, as you have a question come to mind, raise your hand. Uh, Mylon will run the mic. And uh, so this is gonna be a conversation. So we don't have to wait for questions at the end of our session here. Uh, as you have a question, come along, go ahead and raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll have a dialogue going. Uh, so an overview as to how Julie and I work together. Um, how often am I in your office? <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> so sure. Julie handles, she handles all aspects of every real estate deal that I do, um, except the lease options. Doug's correct. firm still handles the lease options. That is correct. So all of my purchases, all of my sales that she's handling, you know, if she's representing the buyer, uh, and all of our rent to own buyers, we refer to Julie, right? So all of my purchases uh, go through Julie. She handles every transaction that I do. And so, so let's, let's just sort of walk through a deal as to what that looks like and how it happens. So when, and y'all met Kim yesterday, the acquisitionist, when we have a deal and we've got it under contract, like yesterday, Kim and I got a new deal under contract. Mm -hmm. Don't know if she sent it to you yet or not, but that was just yesterday. The seller is Chris Houston. Yes. She's already sent it to you. We, we were emailing about it last night. There you go. It's Kim and you were working at night. Correct. From home. Yes. So there's another part of our relationship. Julie takes care of Jay. Yeah, <laughs> From home. On vacation. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. By the way, Robin... Her paralegal is here in the room with us as well. So everybody give Robin a hand back there. Say hey to Robin. Uh, so anyway, um, so we got this deal under contract. Um, so I'm going to let you roll with it, Julie. Kim contacted you yesterday. What was that conversation about? Uh, was it email? Was it on the phone? What happened? So what happens in, there are several different kinds of transactions that Jay and I deal with. I'm sure we'll talk about many different ones. So this one is, it sounds like we're just going to go with a typical Jay founder property to purchase. How do we get it into his hands? So Kim emails me and says, hey, I want to give you a heads up. Because of the turnaround time that Jay requires, which is a pretty quick turnaround time, he, Kim needs to give me a heads up because it may take a few days to get all the necessary parties to sign the contract. Well, a few days is a lot of time when we're dealing with our kinds of transactions. So she gives me the heads up and says, hey, Jay found a piece of property that he wants to buy. Here's the address. These are the people. Um, this happened to be one that I closed on back in, I think, 2016. So I actually, as soon as she said it, because I remember random things, I immediately knew that um, we had done that. So that immediately tells me, okay, I, that's kind of going to make the process a little bit smoother because I've already done the title work on it within the past five years. So you did the title work on the house that I'm buying. This is Mayberry? The, the, Yes. 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 I did. I did the closing five years ago when he bought it. Okay. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, I, I kind of in my head know that, that that streamlines the process a little bit. So Kim and I went back and forth. This one was a little bit tricky because they are current tenants in the house. And there was a question about who needed to sign. So that's what we were talking about last night. I think that's what she said. I, I could be. It was 930 at night. And um, but but we were, all know a lot more we about were texting about that right. and we just wanted to make sure that we had the right party signing everything. So she kind of gave me the heads up. I have not seen the contract. I don't know the purchase amount. I don't know the private lending information. I just know that it's on the way. So she likes to give me that heads up, which I very much appreciate. So you will do. So so let's walk through this. By the way, folks, remember, this is the deal that the seller, Chris, already had another offer at $129,000. And he's taking my offer at about $15,000 less because I'm able to close with all cash. And I'm able to do it all fast. So without private money being available on the shelf, ready to close, I would not be getting this deal. Okay? The, the guy or gal with the $129,000 offer that's got to go get a mortgage and a loan 
if that so you see motivation of sellers varies so chris the seller obviously well first of all he knows me but even if he didn't know me if i'm putting an offer in writing that i'm going to close all cash Typically, the earnest money, how much earnest money do I normally do? 500 bucks most of the time? Usually 500. I don't Maybe think I've thousand. ever seen more than 1,000. Yeah, 500,000. So, a big part of the lesson on this deal is okay, I had the cash, I had the private money, right. Another huge part, another huge part of making this deal happen is Julie can close fast. So, I mean, and we put in our offers that we can close in seven days or two weeks, right? So, Julie, if you didn't know me, and I called up your office, and Robin answers the phone, and you all don't know me, and I've got a house that I'm wanting to buy, and it's under contract, um, if I, like, pray and, and really sweet, how long before you can close? With cash or a lender? With a lender. So with your typical lender, I think that Robin would probably tell you end of November. End of November. Mm -hmm. And today and is... And that's hoping that the lender... So one of the issues that y'all may see that we're running into now with lenders are appraisals. Appraisals, because everybody's kind of backed up, appraisals are taking a little bit longer than usual. And it's nobody's fault. It's just we're in a crazy market right now. So one of the issues is... Jay, because I'm sure y'all have talked with Chris Latham. Yep, he was here He's yesterday. been up there and he talks about, you know, getting the comps and that kind of stuff. Jay's not relying on an appraisal, which is very helpful as well. But if somebody were to call my office and say, I have a, I'm using Wells Fargo. When can we close? And Robin's back there shaking her head going, you're crazy. If you think you're getting in before the end of November. So you're at least 30 days out. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's the closing. Um, how long, okay, so here's a really, really important question. Don't know what your answer is going to be. So Julie gets my title searches done for me in like 24 to 48 business hours. That's like unheard of, right? So you don't know me, Robin doesn't know me, and I'm a real estate investor, but you don't know me, and I want to know what that title looks like. How long is it going to take for you to get back to me or Robin to get back to me and you don't know me and give me a title search opinion? Just to do the title search and give an opinion, it's going to be minimum two weeks. Two weeks, not two days, two weeks. Two days for me, a lot of times one day, 24 hours. And, and I think that I had a, a somebody who I've done a decent amount of work for call and they needed a title search done on a commercial property and I told them it would be about a month that we were about a month out yeah so what's the lesson from that relationships are priceless you cannot put a value on on relationships well you could I could add up all the deals that I wouldn't have gotten <laughs> that would be the cost of not having a relationship. So, besides me being a nice guy, Julie, um, what is it about our relationship that gets it done so fast for me? I would say one of the things that I need is I need communication. I need somebody who, if you want me to do this quickly, you need to be willing to talk to me. If I have a question, I need an answer very quickly. So I know that I can text Jay, I can call Jay, I can email Jay, along with his team, with Brenda, with Carol Joy, and somebody is going to answer in a very quick time. Because if I am going to drop everything and make you a priority, I need you to do your part as well. So communication is key between the two of us. Um, so let's talk about fees a little bit. Um, uh, so what do your fees look like that you charge me for buying, for selling? Of course, they, they look different when you're buying and selling. And what do your fees look like for a person that you may do one closing for and never again? Well, we'll start with the seller part because that's a little bit easier. Our basic seller fees, if you come to me and say, I'm selling my house, can you do our seller documents? 
our 250 and that is pretty standard across the board in this area yeah and um, let me interrupt you on that part of the relationship is when i'm selling a house in the multiple listing service sometimes but not most of the time julie's not going to be handling that closing the buyer of that house that they're buying from me it's in the multiple listing service most of the time whatever realtor they're working with is going to be referring them to an attorney that they have a relationship with or that buyer has already got a relationship with another real estate attorney but to give julie as much business as i can i don't allow the closing attorney for the buyer to do my seller docs and prepare the deed i give julie to prepare the seller docs and they're what 250 or whatever to whatever it is so it's 250 for typical seller docs j seller docs are also about 250 but that also includes usually a few substitutions of collateral and a few satisfactions so if if somebody came to me as a private investor and said i need you to do seller docs i also need you to do two substitutions of collateral and we're paying off two loans, so I'm going to need two satisfactions. That's going to bump them up to about $500, whereas Jay is $250. Now, if Jay came to me and said, I, I need seller docs, we're paying everybody off. Um, there's no, you don't have to do any additional forms, which I don't think has happened ever. Um, then that would probably be about $150. But because we're doing all the additional things, I just don't add on to that like I would anybody else. Yeah. So I interrupted your train of thought there. So fees, mm -hmm. fees for selling, fees for. So I interrupted you by saying I want you, I want to get, I want you to get paid, and actually you get paid from the other attorney, correct? Uh, which is deducted from my proceeds. Mm -hmm. Then they send you the check. So uh, anyway, on with fees for selling and buying. So those are our typical seller fees. Now for buying, if you were to come to me, anybody that I don't know say I want to buy a house, I am paying cash. I don't need you to prepare any documents. It's a straight cash deal. Um, our fee is $750. If you were to come to me and you're using a lender, it is $1,000. Um, Jay's fees run anywhere between $425 and $550, I think. And then, of course, the, the turnaround time. It's huge. a lot quicker. Huge. Um, so that's an overview on the fees. Um, so let's talk about a really, really big subject that relates to real estate investors. So everybody in here knows what buying subject to the existing note means. They, they know what that is. And they also know a lot of real estate attorneys will not close a deal subject to the existing note. So Tell them why that is, why will an auto real estate attorneys not do it, and then tell them why do you do it for me? I think that, that most real estate attorneys don't do that or don't advise doing that is because when you buy something subject to, most deeds of trust have what we call a due on sale clause, which means when they, that person sells the property, they have to pay off the mortgage. That would be typical, right? So what you're doing is you're kind of putting your faith into somebody else that they're going to make your mortgage payment. I would not want to do that personally, and I don't advise my clients to do that because if I'm selling property to Jay off the street, who is not who he is, and he doesn't make that payment, I could have been out of the house for two years and now all of a sudden I'm getting foreclosed on and my credit is going to be hurt because he didn't make the payments, right? Um, or what happens if the bank finds out that I sold it and they say, well, you need to pay the whole note. Well, I don't have the money to do that. He probably doesn't have the money to do that if he's just your typical person off the street. So it's just not advisable on either side. Jay, however, being who he is, knows that if something were to happen and the bank says, well, there's a balance of $100,000 on here, we're calling that due, Jay has the money. Jay, Jay can go find the money on a shelf sitting somewhere and say, well, I'll just refinance with private lender money. So I feel better giving that assurance to a seller saying, I have seen this done and I can 99% guarantee you it's not going to be an issue. And I would not give that assurance to any other seller unless they were selling to Jay. Right, so 
The deal is, when you're buying subject to the existing note, you're going to need to find a real estate attorney that will close subject to deals. And one way that you're going to find them is you may have to show a financial statement that you've got the wherewithal or that you've got the ability to do it. Now, in the real world, we know that there is a 0.000001% chance that the note's going to be called due anyway by the lender. The lender just wants their money. I know of only one person, um, I don't know if John Doherty is in here or not, he's in our mastermind group, but anyway, John is the only person in my world since two, since being a coach to real estate investors since 2011 that I've ever heard has actually had a note called due. I've got two other Platinum Mastermind members in the past that got letters from the bank, and it was a local community bank. It wasn't a Wells Fargo. Local community bank where insurance part department actually knows what underwriting department is doing. That's rare. <laughs> they're next door to each other. Um, but they got letters that said, if you don't pay this off, the really important small word, small word may. We may call them the do. And they never did. <laughs> right? So the the um, likelihood of it being called due is is very, very rare. So uh, you're just going to have to network. Uh, the, the easiest place to find a real estate attorney that will close subject to deals is through networking through your local REA, your local real estate investing association, or your real estate meetup group. The, 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 move, the, the people that run the show of those groups, they're going to know who the real estate attorneys are, you know, that will close those deals. Um, so let's see here. So any of the thoughts come to mind from you, Julie, as to what it is about our relationship that makes it work? Obviously volume. <laughs> volume. Volume works, communication. Um, we respect each other, which is very helpful. But another thing, and I don't know if you have this in your notes, I was going to get back to you because we were talking about fees, um, are the foreclosure properties. Haven't Well, I talked about foreclosure yesterday morning, but I didn't talk about the legal real estate attorney thing that we do. Okay. Well, that's different. Right. So have at it. So one of, one of the other benefits that Jay gets is when you're looking at a foreclosure property to purchase, and you're going to go and make a bid on a piece of property. And I'm sure Jay has told you, you never want to do that without having a title search done. If I didn't tell you that, write it down now. Never bid on any auction property, whether it's a foreclosure or auction.com or any auction. Never bid on a property at the auction that's going to require you to put money down, like right there and then, which they all do that without your real estate attorney already doing a title search and running title work. Um, like one big mistake that new real estate investors make when it comes to the world of foreclosures is they will bid on a property at the courthouse and they don't know they're bidding on a second mortgage. And then they have a wake up call of, oh, I have to pay off the first mortgage as well. So that's part of the, this title search thing. So anyway, sorry. I know. So that's, and that's, that's the risk you run when you don't have a title search is that you are buying subject to another mortgage. So what Jay does is he sends me an email. He says, Hey, this property is in foreclosure. The upset bid period is up in two days. Do you mind doing a, a quick search for me? And what I'll do is I'll do the search. I kind of drop what I'm doing. I get the search done. I report back to Jay. So you're clear to bid. This is a first mortgage. There's no liens against the property. Taxes have been paid. You're good to go. Or I will say, here are my red flags. Either if it's a second mortgage, we're pretty much dead in the water. We're not buying it subject to a first mortgage. Um, we had one, I think, well, this was a different property, but the same thing, I needed a preliminary search. It turns out there were several heirs, one of who was in prison and a few that had some judgments against them. That were worth the judgments were way more than what the property was worth over a hundred thousand so that was not one that he was going to be interested in um so the benefit he gets from doing these types of things are 
there's a few. One, they get done quickly. Where again, if you were to call me, it'd be a minimum two weeks out to do a search. Well, you don't really have that much time when you're doing a going to the courthouse test. And then the second one is I don't charge Jay for those searches. So if he, if we say, um, here's where we are, I think it's good to bid. And Jay goes and he bids and then it's upset and it's upset again. And he has his formula and it doesn't fit in there. And he said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm walking away from this. I don't, I don't send him a bill. So that's another benefit of our relationship because I know he's going to send me his stuff. So some of them don't pan out. Most of them do, but there are several that don't. And I don't send him a bill for that. So let me tell you the value of that. Okay. So Julie was on vacation or something or not available, which is seldom. <laughs> but anyway, this was like three or four years ago. And so I hired another real estate attorney to check title. Well, there's more than one way to check title. Julie checks title online on the computer, right? You can, you can also go to the courthouse. Well, I hired this real estate attorney. You haven't heard this story, I don't think. I hired this real estate attorney, who you know, uh, and it's not Doug. <laughs> I know. And I hired this real estate attorney. I said, I need you to check title before I go bid. I was not clear with my request. The real estate attorney assumed, or should I say took advantage of me, <laughs> and did a title search back to the 1800s on this property. I don't need a title search back to the 1800s. He went to, it was a he, he went to the courthouse and, and did this title search all the, uh, there's no telling how long he was at the courthouse and gives me a bill for $600 for this title search on a house that I didn't get the bid. <laughs> And so, but thankfully, I have Julie that knows what I need when it comes to a title search. Like, when you do a title search, typically how far do you go back? Like, to the usually, last sale? Usually we do a, a current owner the search. Current owner. Um, because you can find a title policy that gives you the information you need. And uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time with these foreclosures, it's a bank foreclosing, so they have a mortgage. So you, you know pretty much when they got that mortgage that it was clear title. So you're just doing a current owner search to see what's happened during that time. Yeah. Actually, we have a question. Can you click on see more and read the question to me? You got it here on the uh, live stream because I can't see it. That's great. But how can we get that relationship with a real estate attorney just starting out? And what are the typical title search charges? Okay. So everybody can hear that question. How can you find or get this kind of relationship starting out? And what are the typical, what? Title search, uh, title search charges. Well, I'll let you go first, Julie. Well, the relationship, I was kind of grandfathered into Jay because Jay worked with my former law partner um, doing the real estate stuff. They had a great relationship. So when I came in to work for that firm and I started handling the real estate stuff, Jay was there. So he didn't have, we didn't have to establish, the, the two of us established a relationship, but he already had a relationship with my firm. Um, I have had some of his students, really, I think one main one that I've done several things for, and we are building that relationship. And what it is, is you cannot walk into an office and say, I am going to be a heavy hitter with you. Can I get this in two days? <laughs> it's not how it's going to work. I don't know you. I've got a stack of stuff and I got Jay calling me on the other line. So that's not going to happen. Um, so what you do is you introduce yourself. Um, you send them an email and say, hey, I was one of Jay's students. Um, or, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. These are some people I work with. I got your name from so-and-so. Um, this realtor told me to call you. And could we meet? Could I come in and meet with you? Or here's a deal I have because, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Here's the deal I have. This is the first of what I hope to be many. Understand that that first one, you're gonna probably be treated just like any other person calling you. Yeah. Because if I go to Robin and I say, we need to fit this in, she's gonna go, why? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she runs the office. So that's gonna be her question and I'm not gonna have a good enough answer for her. 
Um, so you just have to recognize that the first one or two, you're going to probably got to prove yourself, right? Um, and you know, well, trust butter people up is what you do. Good. You bring in cookies, you bring in donuts. You say, hey, I'd like to get you breakfast. It shows that you're willing to invest. If you're wanting me to turn around and invest in you and trust you, then you got to invest in me too. So that helps people respond well to food. And that's always good. But it's just, you know, that's how you get a relationship with somebody. Yeah. You know, um, trust is earned. Trust is earned. And Julie said a phrase a moment ago that is so important, and that is we respect each other. And as even as strong as a relationship is, don't take your relationship for granted. Show honest and sincere appreciation. Honest and sincere appreciation. Um, when did I tell you all is the worst time to raise private money? When you got a deal and you need it funded. Mm -hmm. That's the worst time to raise private money. When is the worst time to start establishing a relationship with a real estate attorney? When you got a deal, you need closed. <laughs> so as she said, you start the relationship before you've even got a deal to present to the real estate attorney. Set the appointment, come in, offer to take them to lunch. You know, that may not work because they don't know you and that may sound a little creepy from somebody you don't even know. So set the appointment and be prepared to pay their hourly fee for the appointment. What is your hourly fee? $250. Right. So, I'm willing to pay 250 bucks. In fact, when I started in the foreclosure business and when I started in real estate, I went to Doug Goins, even though we had known each other through family, but I'd never done any business with it myself. And I, I said, Doug, I want an appointment to come into your office for you to explain the foreclosure process to me here in North Carolina, because I don't have a clue as to how it works. And I don't want to stop making my mortgage payments to find out how it works. So I set the appointment. And I paid his fee. So what's another part of honest and sincere appreciation? You sit down with your real estate attorney for the first time to establish this relationship. You tell them, sincerely, I want to give you all my business. Do not ask for a discount up front. You haven't earned the right to even ask that question because you haven't given her any business yet. But you tell them, I want to give you all my business you know, what is your normal turnaround time, right? Uh, I would not be shy in saying, well, if your normal turnaround time is 30 or 45 days and your normal charge is a uh, thousand, um, would you be willing to sort of move me up the line if I paid you $2,000 for the first deal, right? I'm willing to pay $2,000 for the first deal to start a relationship and like show I'm really serious about getting this relationship started. I mean, would $2,000 get your attention? It would, and yeah. Robin would probably be more likely to put you on my calendar than you say, I'll pay a rush fee. Then <laughs> she's gonna say, let me see where I can squeeze you in. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, that's just like showing good faith that you're serious. Because when it comes down to it, if you're asking me for a rush, what does that do to me? That takes time away from my child. That takes time away from my family because I do my own title searches. So now I'm working at home late, or I'm staying late, and I'm not able to do the things that I would do with my family. So there's a cost for that, right? And you have to expect that. Yeah. Hey, um, Banjo, are you tuned in online? So would you just scroll back through and see if any other questions have come in online? Nope, no other questions yet. So, um, so let's go ahead and open it up for q and I'm sure you all have got some questions about how, how Julie and I work or whatever. So does, if anybody's got a question, raise your hand. Mylon will bring you the mic. If you don't have a question, Julie and I will continue on. We got a question right over here with Scott. So as you're making your way to Scott there, Mylon, um, let me go ahead and explain this is how we work. So when I've got a deal for... Uh, to buy. I've got, I've got a property that I want to buy. There's a way we communicate that information about what's the promissory note going to look like, what's the deed of trust going to look like. And my guess is 
I may be the only person in the world, in your world, that communicates like that. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> so tell everybody, typically, how do you get the information to prepare promissory notes and deeds of trust? And then tell them how do you get it from me and Ashley? So going back to the transaction that Jay was talking about when we first started this, where he has a purchase, Kim reached out to me and said, here's what, here's what we're going to be doing. I know that Jay is not paying cash cash for that. I know he's going to be using a private lender. So I will reach out to Jay and say, hey, whenever you're ready, can you please send me your private lender information so that I can get the documents prepared for you? I will then, he'll say, sure, I'm gonna get Ashley on it. I'll get an email from Ashley. Jay has, I don't know if you share this, but Jay has his form. It's called the closing agent instruction. And it is minimal. And it tells me exactly what I need to know. It tells me the lender, the private lender, their address, the property address, the amount that they're borrowing, um, the terms of the note, how long it is, what the interest rate is, and if there's any special calls or substitution options or anything like that. It is one page, that's all I need. And from that one page, I can then prepare my promissory note and my deed of trust for either the purchase or the cash out refi that Jay is doing. Yeah, so how do you get that communication from the rest of the world? Do some people call you and talk you through No, it? usually I'll get an email um, several weeks down the road from, a, if it's a Wells Fargo or, or a Truist or something like that. You get a closing package. I get a closing package. It's about six pages. Just the, just the immediate instructions are about six pages, and I kind of got to go through there and figure out where all my stuff is. Jay's is super simple to follow. I've looked at it 900 <laughs> times. I know exactly what I'm looking for. Um, it's very easy. Yeah. And all you Platinums and Masterminds, and if you own the Where to Get the Money Now system, that closing agent instruction form is in the system, right? Simple Word document. I mean, actually, it's got like maybe 10 fill in the blanks, maybe, like what Julie just said. Who's the borrower? That's your entity. Who's the lender? That's your private lender and their address. What's the interest rate? What's the frequency of payments? What's the length of the note? Is there a 90 day call option? Is there a minimum six months interest? And that's about it. <laughs> and I guess for all the information that she needs. So uh, Ashley, if we can turn the camera over to Scott. Scott is a platinum and mastermind member. And Scott's got a question. So I've got a lot of interesting. I was going to be this hypothetical situation so I'm going to interrupt you, Scott. Hold your question. Explain to everybody the difference between a judicial state and a non-judicial state. I assume you're talking about foreclosures. I also should have prefaced this at the beginning. I am licensed to practice in North Carolina. That is the only state that I am licensed to practice in. So every state is different when it comes to real estate. That's kind of one of the things that really varies between state to state. And I cannot give legal advice for any other state. So this is a hypothetical. I can tell you the difference, but I can't give you, I cannot give legal advice for any state outside of North Carolina. Um, so judicial, non so judicial, non-judicial is the way they handle a foreclosure. So there's two different ways that you can foreclose. In North Carolina, we go through our special proceedings office, which means, so y'all probably are more familiar with the term mortgage. You have a mortgage on a piece of property. In North Carolina, it's called a deed of trust. The overall concept is the same, but instead of Jay owns property and he gives it to Wells Fargo and they give him money and it's the two of them, in North Carolina, we have a trustee in the middle. So what you would do if you were going to foreclose in North Carolina is you file a special proceeding and the trustee is a, a neutral party and they kind of facilitate things with the clerk of court. If you are going to go the judicial route, you file a lawsuit. So when we're doing foreclosures in North Carolina, now you can still do it in North Carolina, but you don't need to. So when we're filing in North Carolina, you go to the courthouse steps, you have the upset bid, you go through the process with the special proceedings office. Whereas I'm not sure how it is in Alabama, but in a lot of states, it's you file a lawsuit. Wells Fargo files a lawsuit against the borrower saying you didn't pay when your rent. Hence it's called judicial. judicial. Correct. So we're non-judicial here in North Carolina mm -hmm. where you're not filing a lawsuit. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Scott, but I want everybody to understand. So 
Start all over. Just like us. The question really isn't about what we need to do, except that if, hypothetically, the real estate investment becomes aware of the opportunity less than a week before the option, is there some process or need that we can talk, I can talk to the laborers to delay the option? I have the answer, but you go first. Well, I, I was going to say to her to you no. because I don't feel it that way. Yeah. So, what we have um, here, and I'm sure in Alabama, is the lender hires what's called a substitute trustee. So, we got a deed of trust. When she does a deed of trust, she's the trustee. The lender is going to hire a substitute trustee to handle the foreclosure. So if it's a week out before the sale, now do you have a 10 day upset period in Alabama? Yeah, so we got this weird thing. So I'll get back to your answer here in a second. So we got this weird thing here in North Carolina and I think maybe about 10 other states. We have what's called a 10 day upset period. So the process is you have the substitute trustee opens the file in the special proceedings uh, room at the courthouse. Now they're in foreclosure. It was about six weeks before the hearing, and then about four weeks after the hearing is the sale. Now, so we have the sale. Now, of course, now you know in my foreclosure system, we're wanting to get up with the people, the owners, before it goes to sale. All right, so here you are still in the before sale period. But we got this weird thing in North Carolina. The house goes to sale. The bank puts in a minimum bid. Maybe somebody else bids and upsets there at the courthouse steps the bid of the bank. Maybe nobody does. It doesn't matter. So whatever the current bid is or the highest bid right there on the day of the sale, now the clock starts. 10 calendar days, not business days, but 10 calendar days. The only exception to that is when there is a vacation where the 10 days ends on a Saturday or a Sunday, it rolls to Monday. But there's a 10 day calendar upset period where anybody can come in to the courthouse in the special proceedings room and upset the current bid by a minimum of 5%. Well, if somebody comes in and upsets the bid, by 5% or more, sometimes I'll upset it more than 5% because I just want to get rid of people, right? And scare them off. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, so if anybody comes in and upsets the bid, now the clock starts over. Now we have a new 10 day period starting all over. And let me also add within that 10 days, the borrower who is being the one who's being foreclosed on can also pay off the mortgage. It's called a right of redemption period. So they can come in if they get the funds and pay it off and they get their property back. Exactly. So that's how that, so, so bidding continues until nobody comes in anymore during the last 10 day upset period. And now you have the winning bid. In fact, 707 Old Deer Trail that I showed you on the virtual tour, um, whenever we did that and Chris was out in the field, my foreclosure system tracks the current status of all that bidding as well. So if you get my, if you're a platinum or mastermind, you get in the foreclosure system, the tracking continues all the way to the end of the 10 day upset period. And then it tracks it as a REO when it becomes bank owned, right? Well, how did I get 707? My foreclosure system tracked it all the way through the 10 day upset period. I was the person that upset another individual and it did upset them. So I upset another individual that lived right down Old Deer Trail and then they came back and upset me. And it didn't upset me because I knew I was going to upset them again anyway. So I went back in and I upset them and we had a, and so I was the last I bid and that's how I got 707. Now let me answer your question, Scott. I had to go around my elbow to get to my phone. So the answer is yes, but here's how it works from my experience. Substitute trustee ain't going to talk to me. The lender ain't going to talk to me. 
because I don't have an authorization to release from, you know, the, nobody's going to talk to me. And it's a week before the sale. So here's what has worked for me in the past and does not work all the time, but it does most of the time. You instruct your seller that's in foreclosure to contact the substitute trustee. But, and it's most of the time a mill house. That's all they do. That's all they do is foreclosures, most of the time. Contact the substitute trustee. They're going to know who the substitute trustee is because they've been getting letters from the substitute trustee. Contact the substitute trustee and say, I have got a buyer for my house and I've got an offer to purchase under contract and they can close within seven days or two weeks. Fast. Most of the time, the substitute trustee and the substitute trustee's got the right to do it because they don't have to ask the lender's permission. They're acting on behalf of the lender. The substitute trustee will contact the courthouse, special proceedings room, and postpone the sale. Typically, like another 30 days, they'll postpone the sale. And by the way, sales get postponed more often than they stay on schedule. That's why I don't go to the courthouse anymore and bid. Because most of the time, the sale that's scheduled don't happen. Well, you have to think about it. The banks are not in the business of owning property. That's and they, and the, they, and they don't want it. They, they would don't. rather get their money. Yeah. So the substitute trustee knows that the lender is, hey, if there's an offer to purchase and there's earnest money there, the substitute trustee acting on the behalf, they're going to get their money anyway. Substitute trustee is going to get their money whether the sale's today or the sale's in 30 days. They might get more money than if it's 30 days later because they've had the file open longer. So it's like everybody on that side of the table has got an incentive to extend the sale. It's, it's really just getting through to somebody. That's the deal That's right the there. That's the key right there. Because everybody's busy. Uh, my, oh, I'm sorry. Got a question back here, then we'll come up to you. All right. Next question, if you'll scroll around there. Actually, I think we got a question in my phone. Okay. Yeah, there's a question that I'm going to ask you about. One So my definition of pre-foreclosure that I tell them is pre-foreclosure is they're behind on payments, but a substitute trustee has not been hired and opened the file yet. Okay. So a pre, we call it pre-notice, pre-notice of default. So do you need a title search? What was the question to buy that property? Yes. Well, you're not. Well, you're bidding. not going to be bidding yet. You're not bidding in, in Jay's definition of pre foreclosure. But yes, you still want to get a title search. For example, we had one that I did the title search. I don't remember if it was a subject to, I, or a, I think it may have been a foreclosure. I can't quite remember. But I got over there. We had done the title search. Everything came up fine. I got over there to file. So it must have been a subject to, and the person had a tax lien put on record the day before, an IRS tax lien. Well, that throws everything. It was a pre-foreclosure because it ended up being foreclosed on. Mm. Um, so um, you still want to do a search because you need to know what judgments, oh, this is all my question. You need to know what judgments are out there. Well, and another thing too, let me give you a comment on IRS liens. So I have bought one house that was a foreclosure, and this was prior to you even coming to Doug's uh, firm, because um, I remember Doug giving me the advice. So I bought the house, Doug informed me it had like a thirty or $40,000 IRS lien. So here's the way IRS liens work. IRS liens, there's, first of all, your attorney's got to make sure everybody was notified. So tell them what that means. Well, it's just giving proper notice. The IRS has a certain amount of days, and I cannot remember off the top of my head how long it is, but they have a certain amount of time to come back if there's a foreclosure oh, and say, no, 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 we want 120 this. days. 120? 120 um, days. To come back and say, well, we're going to do something with this property. So you have to make sure that the IRS is notified of the foreclosure sale, and that cuts back the days. Yeah, so Doug verified that the IRS had been notified. Um, and so Doug's advice to me was, Jay, in all probability, the IRS is not going to mess with a house for thirty dollars or $40,000. Now, one hundred fifty dollars or $200,000, they're going to mess with it. 
But for thirty or $40,000 on a house that needs major rehab, IRS is not in the rehabbing business, right? They're in the business of taking claim to a property and putting it in the MLS and just selling it and getting cash. That's to their extent. So Doug's advice to me was go ahead and buy the property, but don't start the rehab process because if the IRS comes back within that 120 days, they're going to give you your money back. If they, if they claim the property, they got to give you your money back if you bought the house and the title's in your entity name. They'll give you your money back, but they ain't giving you no rehab money back of you rehabbing it. They're just going to give you your purchase price back. So Doug said, buy the house. If you ain't heard anything from the IRS, or I haven't heard anything from the IRS in 120 days, carry on with your rehab. And now that you say that, it's 120 days if proper notice is given. Yeah, if proper notice. If notice is not given, it just hangs out it there. It just hangs out there. Nobody wants that. Yeah, so the, uh, what she means by that is the IRS has to be notified that this foreclosure is going on, right? Or, or you're buying it or whatever. Christian. Yeah, new question is who notifies the IRS? The substitute trustee. Okay, and my first question was how do you notify the IRS that the trustee is? It's on public record. Yeah. So in my foreclosure system, that's one of the pieces of information that you get out of the special proceeding file. And it also will be filed in the register of deeds when we've substituted a trustee. It tells you who the substitute trustee is. It tells you their phone number. Um, again, that's part of the information you gather when you're going to the courthouse tracking foreclosures. Because I want to be able to call that substitute trustee if I need to. They may not talk to me, but at least I know who. I want to be able to give that phone number to my seller <laughs> if they have like been throwing letters in the trash <laughs> from substitute trustees, which they do. People in foreclosure a lot of times are just big time in denial. Right? Any other questions right now? Oh, we got two over here, Mylon. Any others? Uh, let's see. Thank you for coaching. Oh, well, you're welcome, Laurie. Laurie is like always with me. All my lands. Free coaching Friday ends in like 30 minutes. So we're almost here to the end. You know, come to the IRS and they've got that lien on there. When you purchase a house, are they going to collect the money from the price that goes into the house that you purchase it from? I mean, they don't just go away and forget about the money. I understand what you said about it. They're not going to take that. So you're that one. So are they going to just, I'm just curious when they address it, you bought so their free of cash available, do they just then go and take it out of the back side of the pay for it? Or, I mean, that, that interesting to go away. No, it does not go away, but it may not be attached to the property. There are other ways they can collect. Oh, okay. The, the, right, this is not specific to the property. It is to the person who happens to own, that just happens to be one of their assets. But you agree with my question. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it doesn't go away. Um, right. That's what I was saying. They may just go another avenue. Okay. No, 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 no. They just may just go through another avenue to collect it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, if there's cash in bank accounts, they will seize that person's money. They will suck it out. But they don't go out there. Well, they don't. It, depends. it depends on the value. But, but, but once they know about it, they only have a certain amount of time to do Because it wouldn't be fair to say, well, you have an IRS lien against the house. Um, we're going to let you know about it and then give them three years to decide what they want to do. That would well, I just almost. It's available now that the seller sold the house, you know, the house, that means you're out the seller of the house. Therefore, well, there, there's a difference between a sale and a foreclosure. Got it. Now, right. Thank you. That's yep. If, now, if, if, if it's a sale, if he comes to me with a contract and that seller has an IRS on you, that's a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. And then we do have to address it Got at it. that point. Time for two more questions. One here and then there was one back there somewhere. When the uh, property goes uh, to the courthouse steps, does the bank usually pay mm -hmm. what the balance is or is it different? I've seen it all over the place. Yeah, you know, back in the day, they used to start with what well, the balance well, was, but they also would rather get something. A lot of times, well, Doug Goins, the firm that she started to work with, um, Doug Goins told me years ago, 
what the bank is supposed to do is they're supposed to start the bidding at fair market value, but they don't. They'll either start at what's owed with back fees, but I've seen them do other crazy stuff too. Over the years, I've seen them start at like low to get a bidding frenzy going. So you never know. You never know what they're going to do. And, and tax foreclosures are a whole different beast as well. Tax foreclosures usually start lower because they usually do go with what's owed. Yeah, plus that's fees, all. That's all the four, which are usually a lot lower than a mortgage. Yeah. And uh, y'all met Joe Myers and Luke. They were standing up here. They won the award for most valuable gift. That's one of their specialties. I mean, they they specialize in researching you know, tax liens and, and tax foreclosures and clearing up nasty titles and you know all that all that kind of stuff. Um, um, here's a big piece of important advice that people have gone to jail for. And I learned it the hard way, and thank goodness I didn't go to jail. <laughs> so it is illegal. It is illegal for parties who are bidding on a foreclosure, separate parties, to have conversation about their bids to rig the bidding process. Here's an example of that. Let's say um ashley bids on a property and let's say i call up ashley because her contact information is on public record at the at the special proceedings office you can see all the bidders right by the way that's a great if you're a wholesaler uh god bless you but if you're a wholesaler and a, the quickest way to build your buying list, buyers list is go to the courthouse and look at all the people that are bidding on foreclosures in the special proceedings room and there's your buyers list <laughs> For people that's got cash. But anyway, I digress. Let's say Ashley bids on a foreclosure and I call up Ashley. I get her contact information from the courthouse and I say, Look, how much would it take for you to stop bidding? And I offer you money. Or I say, I'm gonna I'm gonna bid on this property. I'm gonna upset your bid. Um, why don't we just go into this thing together? Any kind of collusion there of us working together to stop the open market from bidding on the uh, foreclosure is danger, big time. In fact, the way I learned about this is I had an attorney in this town about eight or nine years ago, someone you know, call me, I'd bid. I have been, and the attorney calls me up and offers me $12,000 to go away. I called Doug Goins, and I said, Doug, what do you think about that? He said, well, do you want to go to jail? <laughs> and I said, well, I guess that attorney would go to jail too, right? <laughs> so that is a big, big, big no, 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 no. If you're interested in knowing who that was, I'll tell I you know, on record. I would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, hey, y'all, we have reached the end of Free Coaching Friday. Has this not like been a fantastic session with Julie, the real estate attorney? <laughs> And everybody that's watching here on the live stream or you're watching on the replay, thanks for joining us. Do me a big favor and help share this information out. Hey, if you're watching on the live stream right now or you're watching the replay, send me a bunch of love right now. Send me some red hearts. And thank you, Jenny. And after you send me the red hearts, thank you, Greg. After you send me the red hearts, type in the comment bar right now something like wonderful or I loved it or I thank you. Uh, but don't say anything that you didn't like. Right. So <laughs> you just love it. All right. Thank you all for joining here on Free Coaching Friday. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. And we'll see you right here on the next Free Coaching Friday. Bye for now. Everybody give these people online a great big hand. Awesome. All right. Any parting comments, Julie? Any final thoughts, final words, final advice? Uh, or have a great weekend? <laughs> it's
it's, it's really just getting those relationships. Get your relationship with your realtor. Get your relationship with your attorney. Be loyal. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Show them respect. And it all kind of falls into place. Awesome. And let's, have a good weekend. Let's give Julie another great big hand. <laughs>